welcome to HealthCast, the heartbeat of health IT. I'm Alexander Bolova, production lead at GovCIO Media and Research, and today we're discussing various biases in the healthcare space and how you can avoid them. With me today are senior researcher Sarah Seibert and staff writer researcher Jayla Whitfield. Hi, everyone. Hi, Alex. Hello. We are all aware of the danger that biased data presents in the healthcare space, especially with AI becoming more ubiquitous by the day. But it's not just computers that are at risk of biased decision making. People bring their own biases to data and decision making, which is what brings us to the topic of today's episode. Sarah, can you explain how we came up with this bias identification tip sheet? Yes. So as you mentioned, implicit and explicit bias have historically led to disparities in health and patient care, limiting diversity of the healthcare workforce, uh, inequitable distribution of research funding, and more. So what brings us to the tip sheet today, uh, members of our Health Tech Equity Working Group joined together on May 11th to outline some of the most pressing biases in healthcare and develop solutions to improve the way technology is developed, research is conducted, and patients are studied. So the tip sheet that we're discussing is going to be the result of that discussion from our working group. It is not yet published, but it's in development. So you're getting a sneak peek if you're listening today. Wow, breaking news on HealthCast early access. I think this might actually be the first time that we're getting something on the podcast that isn't on the website yet. So I'm really excited to dive into this. Let's get started with our first bias, lamp post bias. Sarah, what is this? Yeah, so I'll back up just a tiny bit. The way the tip sheet is structured is we have a bias that we identified, an example solution. So basically for lamppost bias, that's a type of observational bias that occurs when people only search for something where it's easiest to look. So that would be like, oh, I have a question about what is health IT? You go into Google, search what is health IT, and you click on the first link that you get. So (laughs) it's the easiest way. It's basically to summarize the easiest way to get an answer is how you get your answer, even if it's not the right answer. (laughs) So to mitigate the impact of lamppost bias, technology researchers and developers should search for answers not only in visible areas like your first Google search, but also study new grounds. This could mean people, you know, not only researching a specific group of people, but being more inclusive with your research. So they should research a wider representation of the population rather than just using a minority to generate a majority result, if that makes sense. So it's important to put these discoveries in proper context. And that's what leads to a lot of these biases is that it's not properly defined how you found the answer you know, what groups you researched, what the percentage of that was, and then putting that in the larger context of the healthcare ecosystem. All right. Thank you, Sarah. The next bias is average bias. Jayla, can you tell me about that? Yeah, Alex. So when you think of average bias, this is something that happens often in the healthcare field. It's when healthcare providers assume that patients have similarities because they may have, they may look the same, they may present the same symptoms, things of that such, and they may receive the same diagnosis as a previous person because of those similarities. But when it comes to this bias, it's important to remember that every patient is unique, that they shouldn't all be put under one category, that you have to look into the details of each patient to make sure that they're receiving the right diagnosis. So the solution to this that we came up with is that healthcare professionals should be aware of the additional needs of each and every patient. Um, They should factor in every detail that they find and not just assume that because of patient's certain race, ethnicity, or symptoms that they are similar to a previous patient. And they must treat every patient as a unique individual. Yeah, individualized medicine is just so important. It's also a topic, a uh, quick plug, that we have covered in our Cancer HealthCast mini series, very specifically about cancer treatment there, but just to show how applicable this um, bias solution is. Next up, we have our anchor bias, Sarah. 
Yes, drum roll. Anchor bias is a cognitive bias where people rely too heavily on the first piece of data or information given on a topic. So anchor bias commonly results from paying too much attention to one finding and not listening to a patient's full story or reassessing the patient when information doesn't correlate with their symptoms. I think this actually happens a lot when patients start talking to their doctor, they may say something and then the doctor automatically says, oh, I know what it is and maybe cut the patient off. But it's important to listen to everything the patient says, because just because you think it's the first thing that comes to mind, it may not be. Um, so I think listening to patients is really important when it comes to this bias. So to mitigate this bias, research suggests that while there's no way to eliminate bias, it's possible to develop strategies to help reduce its likelihood of occurring, such as eliminating words that might introduce bias, reporting only factual information, being careful to separate professional decisions from personal feelings, and developing cognitive walkthrough strategies for scenarios where bias is more likely to be present. Yeah, and it sounds to me like there is some overlap between lamppost bias and anchor bias in terms of like the first and easiest thing you see is what you go with. All of these biases definitely play into each other, but I think the main takeaway from those two is just get to know people because people are really at the heart of, I mean, healthcare in general. So next we have socioeconomic bias. Jayla? Yeah, I think this is a bias that we had a lot of conversation around just because it impacts everyone. Everyone's different. Um, everyone comes from different social and economic backgrounds, which impacts their income, their education, their employment, all of those things. But most importantly, it impacts their health care um, and impacts what they're able to afford when it comes to medical care and what hospitals they're able to go to and what neighborhoods. So I think it's important. Um, we defined it as an individual socioeconomic status is usually based on their background, and it includes those factors that I mentioned. When it comes to an example of this, um, just imagine a person going to visit the doctor that comes from a low socioeconomic background. So maybe they don't even have health care insurance. Um, maybe they don't know much about the health care system. And when that person goes to visit the doctor, the doctor may automatically assume based on um, the way they're dressed. Maybe they don't have good clothing. Maybe they're not well taken care of. They may assume that that person is less knowledgeable about their health care and the things that they need and they may treat them differently because of that. And that can affect the care that they receive. Um, so that's important. And I know there may not be a one fits all solution to this, but it's definitely a bias that needs to be tackled head on first, something that everyone needs to be really focused on. When it comes to healthcare professionals, they need to be in training and be aware of the challenges that marginalized groups face and increase their contact with them, know how to approach those individuals and have those important conversations with them so they feel more comfortable in those settings and don't jump to conclusions based on that person's socioeconomic status. And I think that can help overall. Yeah, definitely. And I think that last bias kind of completes this, I want to say quartet of um, human centered biases, which I think really, as you were saying earlier, at the heart of it is just treat individuals as individuals and don't make assumptions. Get to know people is the first step towards avoiding bias in the healthcare space. As we move on to the next set of biases, it looks like these are all a little bit more about human relationships with technology as like a tool that maybe they're relying on just a bit too much to queue up Sarah's next bias. Well, yes, as we jump into the tech of it all, uh, the over-reliance on technology is one of the biases the working group members outlined, and that is very much could be a definition in its own name, but it's the false perception that technology is fully objective or free of bias and is able to outperform humans. So one example of this is automation bias. So that's the tendency to favor information supplied by technology and ignore a manual source of information that provides contradictory information, even if it's correct. 
So the solution to this would be to improve the reliability of technology and encourage clinicians to more accurately assess its reliability so that appropriate monitoring and verification strategies can be employed. So you're telling me that if I go, hey, Siri, uh, are you trustworthy? All right. Well, it's not it's not speaking for some reason, but it did go, hmm, I don't have an answer for that. So there's something else I can help you with. She does, which is a great reason not to trust technology. No, I'm not going to go that far. Obviously, that is an excellent point that, you know, technology is a tool, but you wouldn't trust your hammer to design a house. You know, maybe that's too <laughs> abstract. <but. laughs> I, I noticed it most when I left my phone in a lift and then could not retrieve my phone because I needed my phone to get my phone. So that was unfortunate. <laughs> I mean, that's why I always have a map and compass. That's a lie. Definitely don't. Anyways, Jayla, on to our next bias. Can you tell me about it? Yeah, it kind of ties into the previous bias that Sarah just touched on. This is computer versus patient is what we came up with um, in the working group. And basically, it means that Sometimes doctors rely on the technology in their computer more than the patient. So putting your computer in the outcomes that they put out over your patient's perspective, um, which gives just bad results altogether. Basically, technology is kind of decreasing patient-doctor interactions between healthcare providers, and they're listening to their computer before the patient. So, for example, imagine that a patient enters a doctor's office, they fill out all their symptoms on a little tablet or iPad, and then they go in to meet with their doctor, and the doctor maybe says, hello, how are you, and then completely looks at this iPad with all of these symptoms and doesn't ask the patient anything that's wrong with them. I think that's probably the wrong way to go about that because the patient may have forgot a couple of things or they may need to go in depth about some of those symptoms. So doctors have to make sure that they're not just looking at that iPad and that information in that computer, but also listening to their patients. So the solution that we came up with is that healthcare professionals should be active listeners and focus on the patients to provide the most accurate diagnosis. The computer is just a tool to help them get that. Definitely. Moving on from doctors of science to doctors of data, statistical bias. Tell me about it. Yeah, so statistical bias is when a model or statistic is unrepresentative of the population. So there's a bunch of different subsets within statistical bias, but one example is selection bias. So selection bias emerges from working with a specific subset of patient data instead of the whole, rendering samples unrepresentative of the entire population. It's usually tied to only using data that is easiest to access. Have I said that too much in anchor and lamp post and then creating statistics from that? <laughs> So one way to mitigate statistical bias is by creating surveys or collecting data to give clearly defined requirements for your target audience and give all potential respondents an equal chance of participating. Then you can enact proper oversight of the study to check for unconscious bias in the sample selection process and data collection. Yeah, this point uh, hits pretty close to home, given that back in my college days, I was doing some political science research, and I can just see my professor nodding their head in approval at this being identified as a bias. So nice. Last, but certainly not least, continuing on with the data trend, testing and data bias. Jayla, can you tell us about that? Of course. So testing and data bias, another important one. It's based on testing groups and the technology created to help patients. But to break it down, basically, sometimes those devices and things that are used to check and see what's wrong or measure what's going on in a person's body 
are only made for certain populations. So for example, if you think of the devices that doctors use every single day, some of those devices were made with certain races or genders in mind. So they may have been only tested on those races or genders. So that means when a person walks in that it wasn't tested on, they are using that same device, but it wasn't made with them in mind. And that's an issue. It can cause bias. So a solution that comes with this is that we must broaden the testing groups when we create these devices. And also we must make sure that the devices that were created with only certain people in mind are taken out of the game and we put in new devices that are for everyone or you know are specifically met with certain people in mind if that is what it's gonna be. Thank you, Jayla and Sarah. Those are all of our biases from our tip sheet. Obviously each one has its own details and specificities, But overall, I think the takeaway is human-centered design, inclusive human-centered design and approaches to people and data and healthcare. When it comes down to it, at the end of the day, everyone is unique. You should not assume that a one-size-fit approach will work. And these are just great little tips that can help you along the way that all add up to a much better, more inclusive and healthier whole. So thank you both for this great discussion today. That's all for this HealthCast. If you like what you heard, make sure you subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice. And if you'd like to help us out, leave a review as well. We'll be back in two weeks with a brand new episode of HealthCast. I'm Alexander Bolova. I'm Sarah Seibert. I'm Jayla Whitfield. Thank you for listening. HealthCast, along with GovCast and CyberCast, is a production of GovCIO Media and Research. For more podcasts and to check out the other shows, head to govciomedia.com. Watch out for new episodes released every Tuesday and Wednesday across our shows. You can follow all of them on your favorite podcast platform. And if you like what you heard, make sure to let us know by leaving a review. And if you have any topics you think we should look into, contact us at newsletter at govcio.com.